All right, so it looks like we are now streaming on uh, YouTube, which is new for me, but um, uh, I guess all 12 people that are watching will uh, uh, figure it out. Um, so let's start with uh, what I've, I've got a checklist here of who have joined us. Um, so let me just go through that so that we're now that we're on on uh, on YouTube. Uh, Scott Allen. Are you there? Here. OK, uh, Rick, here. Frank, Rick Frankie. Oh, present. Dick, Debbie Goslin. Present. Duncan Hood. Hey there. Frida Wildy. Present. Lomax speaking. Uh, Tammy Hook, our reporter. I see Tammy. Hope Stewart. Yes, I'm here. Ashley Leonard. I see that she was watching. Uh, I see Alderman Arnett is on but muted. Uh, Mr. Devlin is there somewhere. Or was. Uh, he's, uh, he's muted. Uh, I don't see him. Mr. Dales is yeah. here. And we have. Hope Stewart, I think I said, who am I missing? Anybody? Have I mentioned any, have I missed anybody? Go John ahead. Arison. Oh, John Arison. Thank you, John. I don't know, for some reason, not everybody is coming yes. up on my screen, but John, you were there early, so thank you. Yeah. All right, um, as I usually do when we have guests, I defer to, uh, I just go ahead and start with the, our guests so that uh, to the extent that they want to either leave the meeting or um, have other things they can be doing while they just listen, um, that uh, is, is um, fine. So I'll start with um, Mr. Devlin. What I, I did circulate the letter that you sent on behalf of Annapolis City Marina. I circulated that to uh, the board earlier this, this morning. So everybody has had, an has had a copy of that. How many have had an opportunity to read it? I don't know, but I have done that. Um, and I also uh, provided a copy to uh, uh, Alderman Arnett, although you may have also, the letter was written to him. I just didn't see him on the email. So I think everybody has a copy of that. Um, so I, I guess we can start with, um, if you want to uh, add anything to the letter that you sent, um, I'll let you go first then. You're muted, Joe. You got to unmute. There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lomax. And, uh, so this will be the public hearing portion for 1520. Is that what we're doing? Doing that first? Uh, yeah, it's a continuation of the, uh, we had left the record open after the last meeting, um, knowing that there may be some additional comments and I, due to the fact that I had requested, uh, uh, as it turned out, along with Alderman Arnett, an opinion from the, uh, from the uh, Office of Law. So we left the, uh, we left the hearing, the, the, this matter open until this meeting. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Lomax and members of the board. Uh, my name is Joe Devlin, as noted, I'm with the law firm of Council Baradell, Cosmero and Nolan in Annapolis, and we, represent uh, Annapolis City Marina um, and uh, have worked with Mr. Arnett to uh, come up with this bill that we uh, have had introduced and uh, happy to have an opportunity to, uh, to provide some insights on it. Um, we were a little disappointed and surprised last month in terms of I did listen to the meeting and in terms of the merits of the proposition, it really wasn't, didn't seem to get much attention at all. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk about sort of the, the methodology here and what we think we're accomplishing on behalf of certainly Annapolis City Marina, but also the WMM properties, uh, specifically those that have been there since prior to 1987, um, and uh, the ability to have some flexibility there, specifically as it relates to professional office. Um, with Annapolis City Marina, in terms of background, uh, they've been there since the early 80s, as everyone I think knows. And one of the problems that we're running into is that our largest maritime tenant, our largest maritime office user has been the Environmental Protection Agency and a couple of related federal agencies, 
which because of the work that they do, they did qualify as maritime office. Um, they occupy approximately 30,000 square feet of our office building. And uh, they have given us notice or given uh, Annapolis City Marina notice that uh, by February of 2021, they will be gone. And in fact, uh, 3,500 square feet of that space uh, left in August of 2019. And uh, despite uh, aggressive targeted specialized marketing uh, among the maritime uh, industry uh, for that space, the 3,500 space, we haven't gotten a single uh, bona fide or, or potential client to, uh, to inquire about it. So the concern of course, is that we've got this uh, limitation uh, on the property. And uh, we believe that if we could add additional professional office, um, that would not change the visible character of uh, the property uh, and would and certainly would allow us to, to fill the space, we believe, a little more quickly, notwithstanding that uh, we're all coming out of this pandemic at this point, hopefully coming out of it sometime soon. So when we looked at this, we, we, we believe we had created a very narrowly tailored bill. Um, as I said, focusing on the WMM only, because that's where we are, um, and the use of triggers. Um, when we look at our, uh, our use, um, you know, when you look at the Annapolis City Marina and, and no disrespect to anybody, um, because we certainly have some of the nicest waterfront around in the city of Annapolis, but I would, would certainly indicate that, at least it's my humble opinion, that that area of waterfront there, the WMM with Annapolis City Marina, with uh, uh, the uh, Chart House property, with uh, Yacht Haven, et cetera, that's as prominent a piece of property as we can have in the city of Annapolis, right across from our city dock, right across from Annapolis uh, from the United States Naval Academy. And so when people are looking at that and seeing that lively water time activity, uh, the marina and the fuel dock uh, are probably are obviously hard maritime uses. Uh, they are very significant to our local community, our local boating community in terms of that fuel dock, especially, and the marina for public access. And, uh, you know, it has not really been recognized, if you will, in terms of the way that the zoning code has looked at it to this point. And you know, it certainly seems that there is a basis to believe, and I don't think there's really any question of it, that the, that the other uses on the property, the office uses on the property um, finance, help to finance the, the maritime uses, the hard maritime uses. And both in the city council has talked about it and others have talked about in terms of incentivizing um, the ability to maintain those hard maritime uses. And I go back to the purpose of the WMM zone which talks about it's intended to reserve areas along the water's edge for maritime uses, provide an environment for supporting maritime merchandising efforts and to encourage the preservation of existing buildings and uses. In support of specified maritime uses, the WMM district also provides for some non-maritime uses. The visual image of this area as an active maritime center is to be encouraged and maintained. And that's very similar to the initial purpose back for WMM in 1987. And from our standpoint, trying to come up with what we thought was a well-tailored narrow bill to, to help not only our client, but also to help the WMM generally, which is again, this prominent feature, we focused on the, the marina and the fuel dock and putting them together as triggers that if we agreed, if we guaranteed that we would maintain our marina if we guaranteed maintain of our fuel dock, um, then we could get an additional 30% of professional office space for use in our office building. The office buildings have been there since pre-1987. Um, and you know, respectfully, we're looking at that in terms of if, if we can have this adjustment, then the maritime, the marina, the fuel dock, uh, those features uh, will stay in, in being. And just as the WMM purpose talks about the visual image of this area, will be maintained and will be encouraged. And so when we looked at the bill, what to put together, that's how we try to approach it in terms of, does it meet the purpose of the WMM? Is it something that is narrowly tailored in terms of uh, 1981 uh, or 87 code that changed there? Because as you, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Lomax, and as we've talked before, um, originally, the Annapolis City Marina was, was uh, approved as a conditional use uh, in 1987 after a number of amendments of the conditional use, the code changed in large measure. That's where the current four maritime zones came into being. And in so doing, 
uh, as we evolve to today, the various uses that we have there at Annapolis City Marina are now part of the code. And the way I kind of ha have always characterized it is that the old conditional use that we had back there in 1981 has been replaced by the code and the bucket that we needed back in 1981, the bucket, because you couldn't have done these uses together in a package like that, other than through a business plan development conditional use, um, the bucket no, is no longer needed in terms of uh, the, 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 the uses that we have at the property, whether they're the maritime or the non-maritime. And so what we looked at it to be was that if we could get this, this amendment to the law, then, uh, and, and focused on again, the marina, because it, it, in looking at the history of the maritime zone and looking at the way it worked, all of the uses were contained on the land, notwithstanding that just as the purpose of the maritime district says, uh, the most prominent features are on or in the water. Uh, and, and that is characteristic of all the properties there in the WMM in terms of the marinas and the boat lifts and things of that nature. And so we were focusing on making sure that those stayed in place um, to, to be able to incentivize the professional office. So as Mr. Arison had come up with, um, there is a, a, a calculation that can be made from the city code into as a developable waterway area. And so we found that a way to do this, which is to maintain the, the 30, 70 uh, maritime ratio, but to give credit to the most prominent maritime features of the property, which is the marina and the fuel dock. And also we also have a dock shop which in anecdotally talking to people, boaters around the area, that uh, fuel dock is certainly critical to, uh, to the life of the maritime in, uh, and boaters in this community. And certainly the, the dock shop is also uh, a very important piece of that. But the bottom line was we came back and, and put this together to be able to tie it in. And in 1987, when the, the, the zone came in, all these uses started to evolve and they evolved over the course of 1987 to today because for example, the, the restaurant, the retail and professional office back in 1987 was moved into conditional use, but it was conditional use administratively. Over the period of years, things have changed. We now have different ways that things are called under today's code. And so, as I say, as, as we're sitting here today, the purpose of this bill from our standpoint is to incentivize us, Naples City Marina to maintain their marina to maintain their fuel dock, which is in need of substantial repair, uh, a significant investment of, of uh, funds to be able to re redo the fuel docks, fuel dock, if you will, and, and the fuel tanks. Uh, but that would give us the opportunity then to have um, more space in our office building, uh, because again, respectfully, uh, when you're looking at the Annapolis City Marina or looking at the Chart House or looking at, at Yacht Haven, uh, it's those waterfront features, those hard maritime uses, both on the water, on the land, that, that is, is what captures you in terms of the, 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 the heritage, the maritime heritage of Annapolis. Who's in the office buildings? Obviously, we would all love them to all be yacht brokers or other mar marine related professional offices. But the market today is not, is not there. And so from our standpoint, the ability to be able to put an accountant in an office that we prefer to have a yacht broker from an exterior basis, from an outside basis, the maritime character is preserved. And as most importantly, the maritime features of the, the uh, marina and the fuel dock are maintained in perpetuity because if we don't maintain those two key ingredients, then we don't have the ability to do the increase on, on, uh, on the office floor area. And so again, we, we thought this was a balanced way to do it. Um, Again, we're just focusing on the WMM, but doing it in what we believe to be a, a narrow way, but also a very effective way and have a, a real cost benefit, if you will. The cost is to maintain the marina, maintain the field dock in return for uh, some, some additional office in the existing office building. And so uh, we, we really believe that this is a, is a good opportunity. We, we do understand, I mean, Mr. Lomax, I know that you've talked with, with my partner, Jim Nolan, a couple of times. We've talked obviously with Mr. Arnett a couple of times and sure there's always been this thing in terms of look, we need to do bigger. We need to do a bigger comprehensive review. Well, unfortunately, however, um, that seems to have not gotten any traction and you know, we'd love to be supportive of that, but we have an immediate need right now. And so when looking at our immediate need and, and trying to keep it again, narrowly focused and it also 
you know, you mentioned in the mayor's transitional team, it talked about the city should identify uses to support and subsidize Annapolis working maritime industry. That's exactly what we believe we're doing by incentivizing us, or Annapolis City Marina, maintain your marina, maintain your fuel dock in return for the office. So that's an incentive to, again, maintain the most prominent feature one of the nicest features in, in Annapolis is that WMM waterfront, we think is a, is a good trade-off and is a good investment, if you will, public-private investment in terms of the zoning and uh, the use of the property. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of what I would say about that, again, in terms of that. I know the question has come up in terms of do we need to, to amend the underlying conditional use, and respectfully, our position is that we do not. Um, need to do that because the bucket of the bucket of approved uses we had in 1981, we no longer need the bucket. And one of the things that uh, that has also come out of this is that, uh, and I think Mr. Lomax, you may have noted it, but in our letter, uh, we did two things. Number one is that we we got a, a a solid count, if you will, in terms of our gross floor area as defined under the code, and that gross floor area. Um, is in our letters, and that's uh, 75,823 square feet in the marina area. Um, and, and you'll note, and, and, and you talked about it before, Mr. Lomax, in terms of the 27,000, by our conditional use, we are allowed 27,000 of professional office use. Actually, it's business and professional office, including a bank. But everybody's always been looked at as a professional office uh, opportunity. And so we, we believe and what the way we've looked at this is that if this bill was to be passed, then the 27,000 goes out the window because we're again, we're marrying, if you will, or putting together the maritime area and the land area together as a developable part of the lot. So 30% of the gross floor area would be the calculation. So as I put in my letter on page three, um, that would result in an increase um, based on the land but it would not be increased on top of the 27. We'd have to, we would agree to utilize the code provision to make us forward in terms of that. And so uh, our, we would get something back on our 30, not all of it obviously, but, uh, but that's what we would be um, foregoing, if you will, in terms of uh, the old vestige of the conditional use because everything is in the code now, specifically one way or the other, we comply with all of that, but it, it, it would be that if you're going to count the area of the water, then you count the area of the land and the 30% should be predicated upon the gross floor area of the building as the code generally reads. So, so let me ask, uh, you, you've raised a number of points and I'm going to, uh, let me preface this with saying, with respect to your um, argument that the Office of Law was incorrect, um, I am not going to encourage this board to um, contradict the Office of Law since we are to take our, our direction sort of from them. While personally, we all may have diff a differing view, but, um, but setting, setting that aside, I'll, I'll let you uh, handle the Office of Law because they're obviously their interpretation is, as I read it, that any change at, that affects Annapolis City Marina must go through a, the same, same process that was brought about in 050-81 uh, back then. Um, but, it, but what you <clears throat> said has uh, raised a couple of questions. One of which is, is it, is it ACM's contention that when the, when the 1987 zoning was enacted, that, that, that essentially mooted the 051 or 050-81 and you've been operating under the WMM zoning ever since? Uh, no, we uh, we had the benefit of the R5081 uh, as well as the code. Um, but the but the code, but but you were I thought you just said that if if we enact this new thirty percent that you would it would do somehow an amendment to the code would now do away with R5081 whereas before it hasn't been done away with and I'm I'm that one that one's I'm confused about. Right. We, we, we always have the option up until now to utilize the 27,000 square feet um, because that was what was provided back then. However, with this, where we are coming in for an approval of a new certificate of use for a new tenant, let's call it, 
that would bring us onto under the current law, which is the gross floor area. And Gary, so, may I? Well, the current the current law is thirty percent. You were when you're saying the current law, you would you want that current law either changed to sixty percent or or using the calculation of the water of the water, developable waterway, which of course the office of law said that doesn't work either. We would be coming back with, it, well, again, I'm not gonna get into the office of law and we've made an overture to the office of law to sit down and go through this. Um, and we're happy to do that at any point. But, uh, but basically, again, and I'm saying that if the, if the code is changed, then it would be strictly a 30% gross floor area and 30% waterway water and that's what we would be bound to. And that would be. But, but if, the, if for some reason the waterway aspect, the, the developable waterway was not uh, found to be a viable avenue to de facto increase the square footage of non-maritime in order to achieve what you want, what your client wants to achieve, you'd have to go to basically a 60% non-maritime or thereabouts. So, and if I do, if I'm doing the math, is that right? I'm not sure I follow you. So if you leave the, if you leave the WMM zone, it's 70, 30, 70% maritime, 30% non-maritime, but you include the developable waterway as part, uh, as though it were land, but leaving the 70, 30, you essentially pick up an additional significant amount of non-maritime use, even at 30%. Yes, and it's in my letter. We pick up about 20, 20 some thousand additional square feet on top of the 20 some thousand we already have. But and if in fact the office of law is correct that the, um, the develop, the, you, you can only count the, air, the square footage of the docks and, the, and where, the, where the fuel dock is and not the entire waterway, you would have to, you would, to achieve the same increase in percentage you would have to change the 70-30 to something more like 50-50, 60 40 40-60. Uh, using your set of facts, yes. Although, as I said, um, we believe that we are able to utilize, the city is able to zone and utilize that waterway area. The docks- I, 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 I understand that. I, that's, again, sort of above this board's pay grade in terms of that. Let me go back and just, uh, uh, also say, and then I'm going to open it up. I have had a, a question that I posed to you earlier in, in my email, but I'm then also going to obviously let the, the rest of the members of the board have an opportunity to ask questions. And John, I'm not, I didn't forget you, yeah. but um, this board obviously is not just a WMM focused board. This board is a WME, WMI, WMC, WMM focused board. And you hit the nail, I think, really on the head when you said the market is not there for the maritime. But there are two other zones, WME and WMI, that have no flexibility whatsoever to do what your client has been doing or anybody, all the, any of the businesses in WMM have been doing. And that is, I believe you used the word incentivize, and I think that's a correct word. I would have said an anchor, like a mall anchor, but same thing. They have had to. They have had to try to fill their properties with 100% maritime since 1987. And this board has consistently um, said that you know when you're four blocks apart from WME to WMM, um, that doesn't any longer make sense. And it certainly is a uh, certainly is a uh, economic. Um, anchor around the necks of those in WME and WMI. So that's why we have consistently taken the position that this ought to be a fair and even playing field. And I, I understand you have, you have a client to represent and, and, and you're doing a great job in doing that. I just wanted you to understand that this board has members uh, and constituents, so to speak, that come from all of the zones that view um, helping only one zone to their disadvantage um, is not the way it should go. But that's just the, philo that's just the philosophical appreciate that, problem that we have and why the board is sort of where it's at. Um, I did have, I did have uh, one question because 
it had come up in a conversation I had with Ross Arnett and also in, um, and then you raised it when you talked about legislative history. And that was, nobody seems to be able to find the original application that went in that was the underpinnings of R5081. I know R5081 became uh, whatever the council decided to enact, but was there some type of an application or something that started that process? There had to have been some kind of application. We do not have it. And that's okay. we talked right. to Mr. I, mean, I, I don't think planning and zoning could find it. And I, I just took this opportunity when you mentioned legislative history, it reminded me that that had, that had been an issue at one point along the way. John, you, you wanted to say something. Yeah, first, um, Terry, the file in the planning department on this is at least 10 inches thick. Uh, not surprising. <laughs> and it's got all kinds of stuff in there. And it's, it's really hard to, to wade through. The only time I looked at it, I wasn't looking for the original application. So, um, of course, we can't get in to look at it now. Um, I just want to say back to the issue of the conditional use versus permitted. We have to stay a conditional use right now because we lack the triggers that allows ACM to have non-maritime professional office. We have zero triggers. So if we were to abandon our conditional use now, we'd have to abandon our non-maritime offices. <clears throat> the way we've structured this amendment or the way it serendipitously was constructed is that once it's adopted, if it's adopted, we, we're a permitted use. Everything about the operations of ACM and the mix of uses, if 015 is adopted, is then permitted. So we can just let our conditional use lag or expire or whatever, or whatever they do. But if it's not adopted, we absolutely must stay with the conditional use or else we, because we lack the, any of the triggers under the WMM. Um, this bill and what we're trying to do here will help you when your endeavors moving forward to work on the WME and possibly the WMI if you want to, because a lot of people, when we say, did you know that marinas don't count as maritime uses in the maritime zones? They go, really? Marinas aren't maritime? And so the people I've talked to think it's, it's not unreasonable for us to say, well, let's drag some of that 30% out of what's obviously a maritime use is not counted right now. And if this goes through, then that's something that can be done across the board very easily. Um, should you get that, should you get that far in your endeavors? So, um, let me, let me ask you, you, you raised, you raised an interesting point that, that, um, the flip side of people being surprised that, the, the marinas weren't counted as part of the, uh, I'll call it the gross square foot, the land square footage. Um, the flip side of that was, I've, I've had questions posed to me is why does, why is Carroll's Creek counted as a maritime use, whereas other restaurants in the maritime zones are not. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a flip, it's the flip side of that comment, but I'm wondering, would, would, would the restaurant then no longer be a maritime use? Now, let, me, let, me, let me correct you there, Mr. Mr. Lomax, and, and because it's easy to, to, to miss it, if you will, because it was kind of subtle. But back in 1984 or five, yeah, it would have been uh, 1984. Um, Carroll's Creek had been approved in 1982 by two different resolutions, one for the restaurant itself, one for, I think, the liquor, liquor license. Um, but then in 84, um, they had to revise it because what the city had determined was that the city council had made an error of law by counting the restaurant, which was a conditional use back then, another conditional use within the business plan development conditional use. What the law said and the city council adopted 584 was to recognize that that Carroll's Creek as a restaurant was simply not part of the 30% use exceptions. It never really said it was maritime. It just simply said it was not in the 30% use exception category because it was um, a, a, conditional, a standalone conditional use on its own. I, um, I, I will 
beg to differ with you. It, what was it? It was R80. It was R, what was it? Something in 84. I believe if you look at it, because I did look at it, it specifically says that it would be treated, at, it would be counted as a maritime use. And, and that's what, and, and again, I frankly, philosophically, a, a restaurant in a full service marina uh, probably could very arguably be a, an adjunct to a marina use, but it just was, again, I only raised it because John raised it, it because John mentioned um, about people were being surprised about the marina not being part of the count. And uh, I'd had a couple of questions about why was, why, why was this particular restaurant included in that, uh, in that count. But again, um, that, that's, it's kind of neither here nor there at the moment because it, it is what it is. It is what the council has enacted. Let me ask you this, John, because you mentioned the word triggers. Um, one of the concerns that uh, we had early on, and I think we I had we it was in the discussion that we had um, with um, with you and I and uh, Jim when I think we met in my office. There is nothing in the legislation that says what happens if three years from now, for, e for EPA reasons, for whatever reason, Annapolis City Marina decides to pull the plug on the fuel dock and they've already signed a 20 year lease for a, for a, a, a non-maritime use. What is the penalty or what's, where, where is the, the hammer, so to speak, that ensures that those triggers remain and there's not a consequence if they go away? It's the same as any other use that has that's dependent upon the actions of some for example if you have off-site parking for your business use terry i lease some land from you so i can have parking to support my restaurant it's with the full understanding that if i lose that parking from you i lose the restaurant unless i can find other parking or unless i can find another trigger if your use is tied to that fuel dock, you understand that you're entering into an agreement with the city to maintain that fuel dock as long as you maintain whatever uses you have that are dependent upon having that fuel dock. But if, but if EPA comes in and says, for whatever EPA reason, says to shut down the fuel dock. Then they're going to have to figure something out because any uses that are any uses in the office buildings that are dependent upon the fuel dock are no longer permitted. Okay. Mr. Lomax, I, I just I just can't let this go, but I would ask you to go ahead back and read 584A because the order specifically says to reallocate the 7,200 square feet of food service established use as authorized by resolution 3882 from the 30% of the ground area of the site allocated to use exceptions to 70% of the site not allocated for use exceptions. It, it, it never, I found that surprising myself that it never really called it maritime or non-maritime. It simply called it not part of the use exceptions. The use exceptions, of course, being the non-maritime. Thank you. So does that subtract from the 75,000 square feet and then the 30% is applied to the lesser number? No, the 30% the 30 is applied to the gross floor area of the buildings. Okay. Um, it, it was a, there was a, well, I, I'll, I'll, uh, um, let me, let me go to the rest of the board and see if, what questions or comments they have. And as we have done in this virtual meeting, instead of going around the table, there being no table, uh, I, I take this alphabetically. So Mr. Scott Allen is your first up if you've got any questions or comments. Scott, you're on mute if you're trying to say something. There, you there we go. go. Um, I think I unmuted it. Yeah, I think I think it has to be clearly uh, delineated if the maritime uses, i.e., the fuel dock and, and uh, marina part, are stopped. What the consequences are in this situation? Because I don't think you can just sit, kick it down the, the road and say, "Well, you have to figure something out later on." So if if there is a I don't know what you call it, a default if the fuel dock goes away and the marina goes away. Um, I think the consequences would need to be written up on, up front rather than having a future council vote to do some kind of penalty. 
Scott, th um, and I'm, I'm, I was remiss because I only remembered it as soon as you, I called on you. Um, Joe, John, one of the other concerns that have come up is that there are properties in the WMM that are physically unable to benefit from what is going to benefit your client, uh, 2227, perhaps uh, Annapolis Harbor, I did, um, Yacht Haven, who have marinas, but there are inland properties that are gonna be disadvantaged because they cannot have that same benefit. How, how, how are we gonna address those? Well, two things. Some of the inland properties don't have the triggers right now. And they haven't had them since 1987 because they don't have a working boat yard or they don't have a, a lift or they don't have on land boat storage. So those properties were left behind in 87. Um, to your point, there are five properties in the WMM zone that have marinas. Of those five, three have either a, a working boat yard, on land boat storage, or um, the other triggers. So the five properties in the WMM that have marinas, three of them are large enough to have the existing triggers to move forward um, using 015 should it pass. The other two properties, um, Pier 4 and then uh, the one behind O'Leary's um, that was redone, I think it was rebuilt back in the early 2000s. They don't have they don't have the existing triggers now to take advantage of 30%, 30% um, non-maritime. All right, um, next one up on the list, uh, Rick Frankie. Okay, I'll pass for now. All right, uh, Debbie Goslin. Um, I'll pass for now, except to say that um, it has been our position for a long time that the maritime zones need to be reviewed in whole. And um, it's really important to everybody that is in them. Uh, Mr. Hood. Yeah, I, I'm, I have no additional comments at this point. I'm following the conversation. Uh, Mr. Tomasini. Just want to clarify something, John. The the property behind O'Leary's, um, it's my understanding that they're using the travel lift there that doesn't actually get used as part of their hard maritime so that they can put office professional office space in that building. Is that not right? Um, no, John Farrow rebuilt that building and we made him keep the travel lift in there. You have to have the travel lift plus, I think, 20,000 square feet of on-land boat storage. Got it which they don't have, obviously, because it's a very, very small lot. But I do thought, they use I, that I, travel lift? I think they do haul boats with it. Uh, it's been a while. OK. But isn't that, isn't that uh, and it's a marine rail, it's a, really not a travel yeah. lift, it's a marine rail, railway. Um, but isn't that the trigger for the for this O'Leary Seafood? Oh, gosh, Terry, I'd have to go back and look. Remember, Kaufman's Produce stored all their stuff in there, too, when they were at the market house. Right. Well, then there was a O'Leary's had a seafood uh, a wholesale or retail. Yeah, seafood. you know, I'd have to look at this at the approvals for O'Leary's because you might be right. I, I thought that, that I, for some sense. reason I thought that was that the that that marine railway re related more importantly to the restaurant, but it's okay. that's neither here. Well, nor it doesn't help them with non maritime office, but it might right. help them with O'Leary's at the restaurant. Uh, Miss Wildy. No questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, um, and I've exhausted my questions. Um, Joe, what we were, uh, uh, the, we're, because of the, we, the decision that we've gotten from the Office of Law, at this point, uh, I don't think we're there, we were going to change our recommendations because uh, we had asked for the opinion from the Office of Law and, but what we are going to do, take up later on, um, at, at the request of the sponsor is to um, supplement that, uh, that legislative referral 
with specific recommendations that could be included in a comprehensive review. And as I think the legislative referral form pointed out, we were looking at uh, asking that this be completed by um, within 60 days. Now I realize that that's probably uh, problematic that 60 days, but certainly have an opportunity to, to push this forward rapidly enough to accommodate your clients February 2021 vacancy uh, so that everyone can start off the new year or at least the fall with uh, a, a, a more even playing field. Um, and we are committed to pushing forward with that. I understand you're going to obviously your client is going to do what it needs to thinks it needs to do with respect to the Office of Law opinion, et cetera. I would only hope that um, going forward that we can go forward with this in a, in, a, in a joint fashion, if you don't want to call it comprehensive, but at least in a joint fashion that accomplishes the goals that Annapolis City Marina and the w, other WMM properties need, uh, but also do not leave behind the WMM and WME, pro I'm sorry, the WME and WMI properties. Um, I think we're inclined to take, uh, and I'll, this is a little bit for Ross's benefit, probably inclined to take the WMC out of the mix because the only WMC is what surrounds Ego Alley essentially. Uh, and that's all been sort of scooped up into the city doc master plan slash city doc CDAC and um, it doesn't seem that there's much that we ought to be doing or need to be doing in WMC at this point, since that's part of a different broader plan. Um, so I think any recommendations that we come forward with supplemental in terms of uh, uses, et cetera, uh, for both WMM, WME and WMI uh, will not include WMC. And I have to say there are some other um, aspects even for WMM that I think we may be making recommendations on uh, later this evening uh, to send over to as a supplement to the uh, legislative referral form that we previously sent. But uh, I think at this point, it's given the Office of Law's opinion, we're, we're somewhat stuck with uh, waiting to see what, uh, F, what, what success or lack of success you may have with the Office of Law. Uh, because it's it, it does uh, it as we delved into it, it did create an interesting question of how this all inter, this this proposed amendment are interrelated with the WMM eighty seven zoning and the O fifty eighty one in this project. So, that's Harry, if I may quickly, pro, from a process standpoint, the Office of Law memo would have to be turned into a, an opinion from the Planning and Zoning Director, because that's what we in the event that there's a we feel aggrieved. You you appeal the planning and zoning director on zoning matters, not the office of law. Well, and and I think if I remember correctly, the office of law's opinion addressed the questions the MAB raised, the questions that Alderman Arnett raised, and also a question that uh, Dr. Nash raised. So there were they. I think that she raised the issue about the uh, the calculation in the, the waterside calculation. And they responded to her. So eventually, it's all going to go into the meat grinder, I suppose. And she'll have to issue some decision of some sort um, if we can't get it resolved um, otherwise. And then it's then it goes from there. Alderman Arnett has raised his finger. You didn't yeah. use the little symbol that says raise your no, hand. It was the index finger, not any other. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I want to. Um, recognize and let you know that I value this board's long history of uh, concern and um, stewardship of our maritime zones, the, the history, the present, and the worries about the future of maritime writ large, not just the zones, but maritime business in general. And so I took to heart, I read your um, recommendations, I took it to heart, I highlighted certain points, um, unanimously opposes O1520 as introduced. Um, it's already going through some changes um, and uh, I hope th those will be improvements. The legislation is still alive 
Its next stop will be to go to the Planning Commission when it's ready. We're still collecting information, still mulling over Ashley's opinion. Um, but I am especially interested in, and I know it's coming up later tonight, the um, recommendation three. Um, I think it is time to look at the maritime zones in general. Um, I think that we can still do that and also take care of the concerns of the Annapolis City Marina if we start now. And, and that's why when I talked to you, Terry, I said, look, you know, I've heard of the laundry list of things from the MAB. I've read the numerous transition reports to all of the mayors over time. Um, I think there's validity in a lot of those recommendations. And I think it's, t it's time to get going on that. And um, the sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. I am uh, perplexed uh, by the Office of Law findings. As you say, Terry, this is our Office of Law. And uh, so we have to heed it, but I'm also looking for other interpretations. So from my point of view, this legislation is uh, still in process. Um, it hopefully will find its way uh, forward in the um, process to the Planning Commission next and then back to the Council. I understand this is an extremely sensitive area. Everybody is very worried, as am I, about unintended consequences, but I think there are unintended consequences by not taking action and letting the maritime zones and the maritime businesses languish. And so for me, I'm looking to this body to come forward with uh, quickly the laundry, the omnibus laundry list of things to look at all of the maritime zones. We'll deal with the, the Annapolis City Marina and the WMM um, and hopefully expeditiously. The, the triggers are in the legislation are very, very important to me. So I took to heart this discussion, particularly Scott's mentioning, uh, we want to keep the, the hard maritime in the maritime zones as much as we can possibly make that happen. Um, I just talked to uh, Ed Hartman a couple of days ago because he's the only one doing pump outs right now, which I think is ridiculous. He is the only field dock on Back Creek. There's only two on Spa Creek. Uh, marinas are getting more and more expensive and um, marine services are harder and harder to come by. People are migrating to the south to deal and across to over to the eastern shore. Uh, we want maritime in Annapolis and we want maritime to thrive in Annapolis. I do not want to do anything that is going to be harmful to that. I pledge to you I'm in Annapolis because of maritime, um, but I need your help. We need to move cooperatively forward. We'll figure out, this may not be the only piece of legislation that's needed. We can work that out too, um, but I do like, I'm very much enamored with this notion of triggers um, in an attempt to keep what we have. Let's not lose uh, any more of the maritime services and particularly the waterside maritime services. So I really do look forward to working with you. I, I think this piece of legislation has been a huge education for me. Um, I thank uh, the help from uh, Joe and John and others in putting together the record. There are still many pieces of the record that I'm looking forward to. Terry, you mentioned one of them, which is I still am looking for the original application upon which all of this legislation further the resolutions are based. So it's good to know, and in fact, Joe and John, if you remember our very first meeting, I said, I need to know where we were starting. What are the ground rules that we started with and then how have they been changed over time? I still need to know that. I still need to know the calculations, both as they currently are constructed but also how they would be constructed if this legislation goes forward. Um, 
we're going to have to go back to the drawing board if it proves that it's only the riparian areas that can be counted, not the total water area, the marina water area, that could change the calculations. And it may or may not be helpful uh, to any of the maritime zones and maritime businesses. So I'm, I'm in this for the long haul. I really do plead. And I think Phil would have some things to say about this as well. And if we don't, if I don't hear from Phil in this meeting, I will follow up on your request for a phone call, Phil. I'm sorry I didn't get to you. We've been doing another fun thing called city budget, which for better or for worse is done. Uh, I think for worse, but uh, that's my opinion. So anyway, I, I do think the time is now. I think we've long talked about doing this. I think the time is to get moving on this now. And I do think we can do it in a timely way. I don't think we should do it precipitously. I think you can make mistakes if you rush to get things done. And it may not be one piece of legislation. It may be more than one, but this is one of the things that I really want to do in the remainder of this term is to get to this maritime. And I see maritime is not just the zones, but the maritime business. Um, I think that that is uh, extremely important. It's extremely important to all of us who vote that we be able to deal with maritime businesses here in Annapolis. Uh, and we've seen with the relocation of faucets that can be successful, even if not on the water. So anyway, end of spiel. I took your recommendations to heart. I, I'm still proceeding with processing and evaluating the legislation, but I really would strongly encourage getting from the MAB and all of you, many of you have been on all of the numerous mayoral transition teams. So you've thought about this for a long, long time and I wanna hear those thoughts. I wanna, I mean, if it's just to send me the latest transition report, that's fine, but I wanna see what we need to do in either this piece of legislation or other legislation to get to the real task, which is looking at the, uh, the maritime in Annapolis. End of spiel. All right, Ross, thank you. And um, as uh, I indicated earlier, um, I had circulated some thoughts to the board, uh, basically pulling together all of the uh, various, and I, I hesitate to call them recommendations because they're more along the lines of suggestions, et cetera, uh, that have come up over, over the past years. And we will be taking that up uh, immediately following um, this. It probably won't take us that long. I hope it may, it may take us longer than I think it will, but uh, we already have, I think put together a generally comprehensive working list of the various things that have come up over the past and uh, we'll be in a position to get that to you and to everyone uh, uh, shortly after this meeting. Mr. Dales. Thank you, Mr. Lomax and uh, good evening to the members of the board. Good evening, uh, Alderman Arnett. Uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to quickly uh, provide some comments from a group of owners um, in uh, both the WMM and all the other districts. Uh, and I'll keep this brief since I know you've already read my letter and seen my proposed amendment to 015. Um, Alderman Arnett's comments just a moment ago are a great segue for what I'd like to add. Um, but first, let me introduce the, this group that I'm representing. Um, there are currently seven properties and we think soon eight. Um, we're calling ourselves AMPS for Annapolis Maritime Progress and Sustainability. And um, there are four marinas in those eight properties. And I, our main goal here would be to um, address the needs of the eight properties that are very similar to the needs uh, Mr. Devlin outlined for Annapolis City Marina. In fact, um, while Annapolis City Marina is losing its tenant uh, in the near future, even in the course of this proposed legislation, two of the group's members have lost uh, long-time significant maritime tenants and are seeing no demand out there to replace them. Um, I think a lot of the same reasons that um, Mr. Devlin outlined as reasons why this uh, should be something the board considers um, are the same reasons that the 
allowing professional office for certain properties in WMI and WME um, should also be reasonably considered by the board while they look at this legislation as it gets amended by Alderman Arnett. Um, namely, it, the use of the buildings themselves, whether there's a 30% professional office in these buildings won't change the fact that 70% of the property will remain maritime. And for uh, the experience of people on the water or going by, uh, the maritime character of the property and the visual character of the properties will stay the same as it would at Annapolis City Marina. Um, what I think is changed and is part of what needs to be updated as the maritime zones are looked at holistically is the association between some of the triggers that allow for the 30% professional office in the buildings um, and uh, the nature, the value of the triggers uh, isn't quite the same. Whether or not there's um, you know, a 20,000 square foot marina um, on a particular property may not have the same relationship to whether we decide that 30% um, professional office might be allowed in the buildings as it once did. Um, as uh, Chairman Lomax noted, these properties are so close to one another and they are suffering very, very, very similar needs. In fact, in the WMI and WME, uh, maybe arguably greater needs since they haven't had the opportunity to support their maritime uses with any uh, professional office use over the last 20 years. Um, so I wanna be really clear that AMPS is very supportive of Annapolis City Marina's uh, request and wants to see that happen. Um, we would just like to ask that um, as the board has uh, seemed to uh, express, the, that there be a consideration of the other zones needs, a holistic consideration of this particular issue at least. Um, and then we are also very supportive and uh, very hopeful about a greater um, overhaul to the maritime zones um, that has that is robust with the community input, comments from the owners of the properties, and study from the Department of Planning and Zoning. But um, I mentioned a moment ago that Alderman Ronette's comments were a good segue from two, for two important issues. And the reason for that is I've spoken with the current director of Planning and Zoning, Dr. Nash, um, and my understanding is that the reality for a time frame here and actually doing a study that would allow for a comprehensive change to um, the maritime zones is, is not at all in the near term. Um, there's not um, a budget or bandwidth for it now. Um, and so in, in, if we're envisioning a greater rewrite of the zones with um, you know, um, reflection on which of the, the provisions may need updating and how we bring our maritime zones um, up to the same level of regulatory um, uh, flexibility that other successful maritime cities are doing, that review and that, that change may be several years out. And that's the reality um, at, at soonest. What I would suggest to the board as you consider um, this holistic changes and looking at the other zones with this request later tonight is that it may, it may be <clears throat> that the best thing to do is consider this particular request from Annapolis City Marina in a holistic way and consider whether allowing the same thing that can happen in Annapolis City Marina at the other marinas in the WMI and WME would be an acceptable uh, change in those other maritime zones for the, the multiple years at least before we see a greater comprehensive review and change to the maritime zones. I think that if this legislation could um, include some of the other zones in a way that perhaps includes triggers but maybe adjusted and, and relaxed triggers, um, we'll still have 70% maritime uses on all of these properties and you might not even have the 30% professional office unless certain triggers are met. If the board thinks that's um, something to recommend and then all the planning commission and city council agree. But I think those triggers should be part of what you recommend is reviewed um, in considering this bill holistically. Uh, I think we should try to make sure that the other marinas in the WME and WMI are able to take advantage of this flexibility because they really are uh, suffering immediately and um, facing vacancies and the need to um, you know, fill space, but also then support um, the low rents and the uh, the costs of having um, maritime tenants at these marina properties and other commercial marine uh, maritime properties um, that house you know very traditional and well known uh, maritime uses. Um, so I think if you can perhaps consider that approach, that there might be a temporary measure that is holistic of all the all the zones. Um, but happens sooner because of our immediate needs. Um, while the city and the Department of Planning and Zoning has the time that's necessary and gets the budget allocated that's necessary 
to do a study allowing for a more comprehensive rezoning um, for all four maritime zones. I, that would be something I hope you would consider um, or maybe some similar plan so that uh, the maritime properties in the AMPS group and elsewhere don't get um, left behind again as they have been for so many years uh, as we wait for a study which could, I think we all know, take you know quite some time. So um, that's what I'd like the board to know and to think about and I'm available for um, uh, Ross, I appreciate that phone call. I know we've already had several and I appreciate those, but as you consider uh, potential amendments, you know, I look forward to talking and I hope that this board will get to consider the amended legislation again when it comes back. So thank you guys for, uh, for your time listening. So I, I'm, I, interestingly enough, uh, I was at first troubled by your, your discussion with Dr. Nash about this. We're talking about some commissioning yet another study and another study in years down. It is not my, and I don't think the board's intention to, we're looking at the uses. We're not looking at, you know, zoning, rezoning. And what you, what you described in terms of in, incorporating uh, similar kinds of changes in the uses or changes in calculations or triggers um, in the short term is exactly what we have been talking about all along. We don't need another study to know that 100% maritime competing with 70-30 maritime um, doesn't work to the 100% maritime's advantage, nor does, for example, uh, a, several, a number of other things that are all really wrapped up not in changing zoning, but it's simply in changing uses or adding a trigger for uses. And that is where I think this board has been headed and all along has been headed. We've had enough, we've had enough maritime studies um, to probably heat a house over a good winter, um, all of which get put on a shelf, uh, all of which, I mean, two comprehensive plans have gone by with recommendations that have been not acted upon. We don't want any more inaction or studies. What we want is just a fair level, equitable playing field across all of the zones, and I'll accept WMC, but across WME, WMI, recognizing that each of them have some unique characteristics unique to their particular geographic area, but generally all suffer from the same lack of maritime tenants uh, that they need and do need some way to subsidize, and I'll call it incentivize to use Joe Devlin's term, um, the maintenance, the maintaining of their maritime presence on their property. So I think we're on the same page with that. Uh, and I just hope that uh, we can get there without uh, the Department of Planning and Zoning thinking that we need a multi-year study uh, once again, because frankly, I don't think anybody on this board thinks that's the case, but I may be mistaken, but yes, Ross. So I have literally two feet of shelf space with studies and some of them quite recent. Um, and I agree with you, uh, commissioning another study. Uh, I would point out to you and you can take it for what this is worth. There's only one boater on the city council and he's been a boater for a long time. I don't think there's a great deal of interest in mo on the part of most of the council. And I would submit to you the time is now. I'm open to doing this in more than one piece. I'd prefer not to, but you guys have been looking at this for years. I think it's time to stop looking and start doing. And if you agree with that, I really do look forward to your help. I think Chairman uh, Lomax, I just wanted to uh, respond and say, I, I agree that we're on the same page. And um, it certainly would be AMP's hope that a, a more comprehensive change, a broader change could be possible sooner and without any comprehensive uh, sector study or anything like that. Um, I think what will be needed to make sure the change is right is input from the actual owners so that the triggers are written correctly so that the, um, the uses are, um, are uh, actionable or things that can be taken advantage of. And so we're here, we're ready to provide any of the information that the um, board may need or the Department of Planning and Zoning uh, might ask for. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, your direction on that and your, your distinction between 
a long-term study and a, a shorter one. I, I hope that that will be really clear in the recommendations the board makes tonight. All right. Um, let's, I'm going to go alphabetically. Any, anything else, Mr. Allen? Uh, Mr. Nothing else from me. Thank you. Mr. Frankie. No, just to uh, reinforce the uh, idea that the changes which need to be made need to be made now. Ms. Goslin. Nothing else to say except that you forgot Mr. Fagley last time. Oh, well, um, oh, Mr. I'm here. you're right. Mr. Fagley, any comments now or before? <laughs> well, I guess my only point would be surveying and taking in the, uh, the property owner's point of view on everything is going to lead in one specific direction, which it seems the majority of people are interested in. Oh, the tenants into things is, is what I seem to represent on this board. And I think it's something that is progressively more and more difficult for any marine business to stay in Annapolis. And if that is not protected, that was the spirit of the law of the of the maritime zoning. And it if it, if it is lost to minutia and desires from independent people, it's to all of our detriment. It's specifically mine, but that's all right. Thank you. Uh, and and that's a good point. I think uh, to Mr. Dale's point and to the uh, Alderman Arnett's point. Um, there certainly should be input from the tenant side of things. And I think one of the recommendations uh, that we have may, I, I think that's a good point that needs to be incorporated um, as we move forward is that this is not just about maritime property owners because um, it also, it is really about the maritime industry and the tenants uh, more, as, as much as the landlords, the tenants are the fabric of that maritime industry. So, uh, Andy, I thank you. I thank you for, for pointing that out and bringing that up. And I think we'll definitely need to make sure that we add uh, that input um, as we go along. Uh, Mr. Hood. Yeah, <clears throat> I completely agree with um, all of us about the immediacy of the, uh, the need for immediacy here. Speaking from the uh, marina owners side, there's a tremendous amount of stress put on us right now, right now from this virus and just in general with the fall away of maritime tenants. It's very hard to get maritime tenants in. One question I have is if we increase, um, going with Mr. Devlin's idea, if we increase the 30% um, yeah, by including the waterways, does that actually decrease the number of tenants that need to be maritime oriented? Does that make sense? For example, if we take 30% of a given property, but of that property, 10% is actually water that means really there's been no change or no upgrade in the amount of actual maritime tenants. But I do understand how it increases the, uh, the commercial tenants. I get that. Um, I just, my point is we need to discuss this, get it over with as quickly as possible. Uh, Duncan, to your, to your point, the, I think the concept and, and Alden Arnett uh, and Mr. Devlin can correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you bring in, let's say you bring in 15, an additional, I say in the case of uh, Annapolis City Marina, what's the waterway yard? 75,000 square feet, give or take? So it's about, it's about the same as the land, if I remember correctly. So if you bring in 75,000 square feet and add it to the existing building 75,000 square, lands, whatever the land was, you now have, let's say you have 150,000 square feet. 30% which has 70% which has to be maritime but all of the land that you all of the quote land meaning the water that you brought in automatically is maritime so you're bringing in 100% of the maritime along with that extra land so 
the practical effect is to have more maritime because you classified the water, all the marina is, is all maritime. So you've increased the maritime. You've also increased, quote, the land area. The result by applying 30% to that is that you actually get more non-maritime inside the building. Did I summarize that correctly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, there you go. That's, that's where I'm going. Great. All that's right. Um, Mr. Tomasini. Nothing further from me. All right. Uh, Ms. Wildy. I don't have anything unique to add, but I do want to emphasize that I support my colleagues on the board and the chair and the participants here tonight. We're all interested in doing what we can to have a vibrant and healthy maritime industry in Annapolis. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Devlin, I started with you. I'll let you, if you have anything else you want to say, or uh, it's always difficult for a lawyer not to say something. I speak from experience. Yes, sir. No, I, I just I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak with you all tonight and get the, the, the conversation going, so to speak. Um, clearly, this is a, a, a difficult task um, that uh, that we have in front of us. But uh, again, the need is 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 there. Um, and uh, we're certainly hopeful that we can find a solution that uh, certainly helps Napa City Marina and the other WMMs, but uh, but is something is productive um, on behalf of the city. Because, uh, you know, as I said, the, the, the cities, the waters around the city of Annapolis, Spa Creek, Back Creek, City Dock, et cetera, are precious. Um, and it's the, the vibrant part of that that's in the water that, uh, that we want to preserve. And so that's, that's, I think, what we're all trying to get to. Um, so we appreciate the opportunity to see if we can get something uh, done now, sooner than later, um, even if that takes a little more, uh, you know, work with, uh, with all of you. So thank you. Mr. Arison. No, I just want to thank the board for the, their thoughtfulness on this issue and really for the contributions of, of, of MAB for the last couple of decades. I'll, I, to Mr. Mr. Dales, I'll correct him. 1987 until 2020 is what, 33 years? I say never do math publicly. <laughs> <laughs> And last but not least, uh, Mr. Dales, any, any final comments? No, I'll uh, restrain my lawyer's instinct to say something more and just say thank you. Appreciate everyone's uh, ears tonight. And Alderman Arnett, I, I'm going around my screen here, so it's... Actually, I think Debbie had her hand up. I'll defer to Debbie. Ah, Debbie, did you have your hand up? I did, but um, I'll save it for another time. It's okay. just a thought. All right. Um, I'm going to stay on with you to, to hear the next part of this because I'm very interested. All right. But, uh, um, thank you for also letting me speak. I will stay. Uh, we will just move right into the next uh, next part. Um, and I what I realize is that I sent. Uh, well, let me preface this. So I uh, earlier today or actually I started on it earlier after our, my conversation with Alderman Arnett to try to summarize the various thoughts and points that we had brought up, um, that had been uh, brought up to the board, that had been brought up by various property owners along the way, um, and to put them into a single document uh, to supplement our legislative recommendation for uh, 01520. Uh, I did circulate that to the board knowing we were going to be uh, somewhat pressed for time. Uh, and I'm thinking about how I am going to, uh, I suppose I can, let, let me, let me do, let me do this. Let me just uh, very briefly say, uh, because I can't circulate it, I don't think. So what I had sent to the board for us to discuss this evening was to list four primary goals for consideration and certainly to be added to or tweaked and then the and then provide specific recommendations uh, as pertain to the WMM, WME, WMI, either all of those or to each to some of those. And so what I will do is uh, simply 
for everybody's benefit, or actually for the benefit of those that didn't get this, the primary goals that we are started out are, are starting to considering. And again, this is, um, I had just reduced it from our earlier conversations, but it certainly can be uh, added to, subtracted from. One was to the maximum extent practical, maintain, mer maintain maritime uses exterior to the existing or new buildings while permitting flexibility in uses within existing or new buildings. Second goal was to maintain the views to the water from adjoining neighborhoods. Third was to maintain views from the water reflecting a maritime waterfront character and ambiance. And the fourth is, is to create a business environment reflective of the current maritime economy that is consistent with individual properties and with permitted uses that are fair and equitable across the WMC, WME, and WMI zoning districts. So those were the sort of the four goals that I postu uh, postulated earlier today. And then specifically, um, just in a bullet point fashion, uh, and in not in a particular order of importance, but just in the order of actually how they got written down. Uh, one was to eliminate the distinction between pre and post 1987 structures. Um, second was to establish equal percentages in all three zones for general and professional office uses. Uh, and I deliberately left that without having requiring necessarily a trigger, everybody should benefit from a equal playing field in recruiting tenants. Um, the third was, uh, and it was something that I had not addressed, uh, I had not thought about until I saw 01580, was that the parking requirement for general and professional offices uh, be consistent at one space per, per, per 300 uh, feet of office space, uh, which I think is the what it is in the non-maritime zones. The fourth point was brought out uh, by actually by Dr. Nash and my in my in a conversation with Dr. Nash is that in some of the zones on land boat and marine equipment storage and display is permitted, whereas in other zones it is not, which didn't make any sense. Um, next item was on land storage units for maritime tenant and slip holder use only. Um, we have some of that in the in the form of. Uh, pods and things like that, but it ought to be consistent across all zones and probably have some type, uh, some uh, more consistency in terms of what types of structures they are. Uh, restaurant units, uses in marinas uh, with tra transient dockage to be classified as a maritime use, whether you do it as a maritime use or whether you just take it out of the equation entirely. But um, my thinking is, and, and it's been brought up before, is that a restaurant use, particularly in marinas, uh, is as much an adjunct to a, um, to, a, to a commercial marina as is a pool or uh, a, 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 a you know, place to buy a sort of convenience store for tenants, et cetera. Um, here's one, Ross, that um, on the budget side, reduce the tax rate applied to assessed values uh, consistent to the uses. So if in fact you're going to be 60% maritime, then you pay 60% of the assessed, their tax rate is 60%. If you're going to be 30% maritime, non-maritime, you then the tax rate becomes 30%. But it's condition, slide the tax rate, not the assessments, because the state does the assessments, but slide the tax rate consistent with the breadth of uses that a particular zone allows. Um, and that obviously has a budget co uh, consequence, but it also is reflect would, would be reflective of the fact that um, we are essentially, I won't use the word down zoning, but restricting uh, uses um, in a competitive market. Uh, one that's been talked about for years, uh, is more full, the ability for a full service restaurants in the WMI district, uh, subject to standards, of course, and we can work on those standards. Um, the, another one is non-maritime reception type activities, again, in WMI, which has the most land area uh, and the least in terms of neighborhood population, uh, but um, non-maritime reception activities 
i.e. Uh, a wedding reception uh, type types of things, again, subject to standards. Um, an interesting one that was brought up by a, uh, by actually the sailing school is overnight accommodations for their students. They run a weekend program, uh, allow them to uh, have uh, overnight accommodations, not being, not uh, B&Bs, not uh, um, uh, short-term rentals, but just simply for their programs, uh, no bridal parties, but for certainly if you're there for a maritime purpose, to be able to, to uh, spend the night. Uh, bike, and some of these might also be uh, already in some of the zones, but uh, bike uh, bike rental, paddle craft rentals, uh, similar type rentals or services for visiting boaters uh, and marina tenants. Uh, then also in the broader picture, appropriate triggers for non-maritime uses with, and I term, use the term penalties as opposed to hammer, for loss of triggers, appropriate consideration oh. be consistent with them um, and review the current table of uses for other inconsistencies. Because if you look at the table of uses, there are inconsistencies uh, across the zones that could be corrected by in, in the table of uses. Uh, to Andy's point, and I'm glad he brought it up, I think we need to include in there um, the issue of um, uh, when I talk about uh, um, the, 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 the um, to incorporate uh, incentives for tenants, and I'm, I'm just kind of talking, but we need to bring the uh, maritime tenants into the equation in these recommendations. Uh, in, in a fashion that in, makes them inclusive uh, in, in the discussion. Um, that's what I have put out for the board to consider um, and suggested that uh, uh, we can have it, we can just, we can either go forward by having a motion to move that forward or alternatively, we can have a discussion, but if we have a motion, it's gonna lead immediately to a discussion. Um, so now that everybody is up to speed, uh, or up to date at least on what uh, we had. Um, um, it's been out that's there before the board at the moment. So with that, um, I'll start, I guess, really simply start with Mr. Allen, um, your thoughts on a motion to this effect and whether and any changes, tweaks, uh, additions, subtractions that come to mind. Um, I think, Jerry, I think it's a good summary, and um, I would um, be in favor of a motion to uh, approve as we discuss it in, in your summary. Uh, Mr. Fagley. I think that's a whole lot to take in one dose, but uh, I would certainly like to discuss it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Goslin. Um. I was thinking through the conversation about the fuel dock at Annapolis City Marina, and I recognize that this is a little self-serving, but once we get into the nitty gritty of our recommendations as a board, I think that um, there should be special consideration for marinas that do have fuel docks, um, because there are so few and there is risk and expense associated with them that the entire maritime industry benefits from and only a few shoulder that expense and risk. Um, Mr. Hood. Yeah, I'm totally in favor of uh, emotion along those lines. It's exactly what we've been talking about for a long time. So uh, anything we can do to get moving on this would be great. Uh, Mr. Tomasini. I agree with Duncan. Okay, uh, Ms. Wildy. I support the motion as well. I read these earlier today and they look very thorough. Thank you for sending them out, Terry. Um, you're welcome. Um, so what I hear, and although we don't have a- Hey, vote, Terry. Oh, I'm sorry. You forgot me. <laughs> you know, you I've always got forget my, one of us when you do I, that. I do, and I've got my list here and- um, That's okay, I'm, I'm in favor of the motion as well. All right. Um, so 
I, what I hear, uh, I hear two things. Uh, and uh, one from Debbie, which we can certainly uh, add in, and that is um, uh, the concept of uh, consider the unique circumstances of uh, marinas with fuel docks uh, and uh, accommodate, uh, uh, accommodate encouraging the retention of those, those fuel docks. Um, let me turn back to Mr. Fagley, who, um, who uh, had wanted, wanted some further discussions. So Andy, I guess, talk to us. You're on mute. Andy, you're mute. You're on mute. You got to unmute. There you go. Oh, ah, there you go. <laughs> your, lips, your lips were moving, but nothing was coming out. Okay. I'm, I'm comfortable with the rest of the board's recommendation to proceed. All right. What I have as, just in my notes to add here is, um, and I'll, I'll, I can tweak the language a little bit. Um, when I circulate it for final, uh, everybody to look at it tomorrow. One is uh, Debbie's concept about uh, the consideration for the fuel docks to encourage uh, their retention uh, and, the, and, and on both creeks. Uh, and secondly, to include um, provision for, um, uh, and I'm gonna use this in a, I'm gonna, provision to, for looking out for the tenants as well as the landlords and inclu including uh, tenants and tenant concerns in the discussion and recommendations. Um, and I didn't write down exactly how that would be worded, but that would be the concept. Um, so with that, um, but let me first ask Alderman Arnett, is that along the lines of what you were hoping we would do? Yes, very much so. Uh, first of all, let me speak to Andy's point. And I'll tell you, I'm heartsick about what may or may not be happening to Bobby Muller, who has been very important in my sailing and boating life. And so I think paying attention to what happens to tenants is extremely uh, important here. And I think in that regard, we need to figure out any relief we give for owners. We have to figure out ways that that can uh, trickle down to tenants uh, with some kind of incentive system. Secondly, the whole tax relief issue is something we've long talked about but never done anything about. Uh, I had a long conversation with Cardi Templeton about this recently. I think we have to get on that. Um, and then the last thing, in terms of the timeliness of this, I was thinking during our discussions, um, we're doing the new comp plan. And, and Sally saying, oh, we don't have time for this and we need to be down the road. I don't buy that. Um, there's gotta be a maritime section in this new comp plan. The plan was that the first draft of that would be available in July. COVID has kicked that in the head. But I think again, the time is now. Uh, I don't want maritime to be left out of the comp plan be an afterthought, another, you know, let's take 10 or 12 years to do a study and, and make a, a sector study report. Th we want it in this next comp plan. And so, um, yes, I've, I think that list is, um, it is provocative. Uh, I agree with Andy, there's a lot to think about there um, and we'll, we'll shape it, but that's exactly what I was looking for. Now, the question is, how do we, get that into some actionable form and uh, we'll have to work on that. Uh, Ross, to your point about the uh, comprehensive plan, let me just um, bear with me just a minute. Um, the, uh, because I need to want to, back in uh, July, and I was just looking to find it, but. Back in July of 2019, this board made recommendations for inclusion in the comprehensive plan. And those have been sent to Dr. Nash and she has had that. We, we proactively provided her with the maritime section that in, encompassed basically doing what we're 
doing without the benefit of the plan, although we could be do, certainly be doing it under the, the current 2009 plan without having to wait for the 2019 plan. But we have already provided that input and um, um, Mr. Hood, Duncan has been the liaison to um, Sally's, uh, to the comprehensive plan discussions and has attended the various meetings um, with uh, providing our input. Yeah, so she's really gotten that twice. And the last time was what, uh, probably five months ago? Uh, right, with that, that, but so yes, we were, we're, we've been proactive with the comprehensive plan also. Can I get that, please? Uh, you can. I, I was looking for it as I, as I was talking, but I didn't put my fingers on it right away. All right, let's turn back to the, um, let's turn back to the, uh, current recommendations. Is there a motion to adopt? Uh, is there a motion for me? Is there a motion to adopt the recommend goals and recommendations um, that I have outlined subject to simply circulating a final draft for everyone's uh, final input? So moved. Okay. And is there a second? Mr. Hood, I saw raise his hand. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion. Um, we will take is all in favor. Aye. Aye. Raise your hand or do something if you're on mute. Aye. Aye. Is, is any of any of is there any opposed? I don't see any hands raised in opposition. Is there and I hear no voices. So um uh, uh Tammy, that was uh, uh all in favor and no opposition. Um so that concludes the um I think that concludes everything on 01520 and its uh, its uh, various offshoots. Uh, and I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, patience in this. Uh, I think we have an opportunity to uh, do some good, and I certainly want to. Uh, I, I want, Andy, I want you to continue to kick me and remind me that I have to be uh, inclusive in my language, even though I tend to be inclusive in my thoughts, but I need to make sure I'm inclusive in my language um, and please continue to uh, be that person that uh, that goes me into that. Uh, my comment, if I could have one, uh, 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 yes or no, uh, okay. is just that the people, Debbie's father, who, who, who created this initially, took a whole lot of uh, chutzpah to to do something that was really not in their best interest in a lot of ways. They created something that was limiting them specifically and they didn't, they didn't gerrymander it to make it, you know, suit the individual landowners who were, who were putting the thing together. And uh, I, re I, I am amazed that they were able to do what they did. And I think it's up to us to be just as amazing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um... All right, that, th with that, I think what we'll do, given the hour. Um, hey, Terry, yes. Duncan, um, I just saw a uh, comment from uh, Phil Dales. Phil? Uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not, oh, I see there's my little chat thing has two on there. Okay. I have some of the documentation that we would be, excuse me, I don't believe her. Okay, um, Mr. Dales has, um, and I will, uh, since we are being recorded, um, has indicated that um, we sh I should not, I may, I may have, that I, Lomax, may have mischaracterized his comment regarding uh, Dr. Nash's uh, uh, desire for a long-term study, um, but she did, uh, she did not uh, indicate that a the uh, what we're doing could not be con, uh, considered during the ongoing camp comp plan process. I also um, and the, she may have been referring to a separate study. And I think to Alderman Arnett's point and my earlier comment, I think we think we, I think it can be done not only in the in the in the ongoing comp plan process, but can be considered uh, even before that under the current comp plan. So I think we're not. I don't think we're boxed in by uh, 
the by either the future or the past the current comp plan. Um, let's see. I, I have to remember to look at these little chat buttons because I don't think to look down there. Um, let's. Uh, I we don't have a whole lot else on the agenda and we can run through pretty quickly. I think the first thing is uh, that we ought to do just so we keep Tam, Tam, Tammy up to date. Is there, a, uh, everybody got a copy of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from May? Now, uh, Mr. Hood is a motion in the second. I see Mr. Feggy raise his hand. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I, I, I guess I say, is there Aye. Any, any, any opposed? Aye. No. Um, all right, Tammy, the minutes from May are approved. Um, Mr. Frankie, any update from the county MIAB? Uh, yeah, just a quick one, actually two issues. Um, we uh, had a virtual meeting on the first uh, and um, Mr. Basu attended. Uh, he is the CEO of uh, the SAGE group conducting the uh, uh, you know, the survey for the economic survey for the group, uh, basically was reporting on the delays caused by uh, COVID, as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> and um, wrestling with the data problem, which we told him he was going to have of trying to winkle out the, the real data about the maritime industry. Uh, there is no hard date set for the delivery now, but hopefully by the end of the summer. So that's sort of where we were. But the more interesting one from our point of view uh, is that Dr. Barker attended uh, and he reported that the uh, NDZ is proceeding much faster uh, than anticipated and may be complete by August of this summer. And he also claimed that Anne Arundel County has committed $8,000 to the education program, which he proposed to be administered by the Severn River Association. So with respect to it is proceeding, are we talking about proceeding uh, at the at DNR? I, I, I don't think it's proceeding there. No, quickly. his claim was that it will be passed by EPA by August of this summer. Have they actually, have they published it in the Federal Register? I, <laughs> he, well, there were, that question came up and he didn't know. So there really was no information about that. Okay. That's remarkable. That's so, concerning. Yes, yeah. it is concerning. Um, Boats won't be able to get ready by August. Yep. Of 2021. Oh, I thought you said this to August. Well, I know, or, or by 2021. <laughs> Correct. No, he was saying this August, 2020. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we need to uh, follow up on that one. Uh, I don't Hope, anything on uh, from you? Um, I can be real quick. So first, recovery zones have launched. So I just want to give a special shout out to Mike Tomasini for organizing the Eastport Recovery Zone. He's been a huge help. Also, for the Small Business Recovery Task Force, Susan Zellers has submitted the draft recommendations from the Maritime Subcommittee. So look out for the final reports coming in July. All right. Um, Comp plan status is we've already somewhat talked about. It's meandering, and I suspect it's been delayed because of COVID-19. Uh, and I take it, Duncan, I think you said the last meeting was three or four months ago, so nothing there. The, That's city, right. the city Doc Action Committee, there was a I, there was a, um, uh, a virtual town hall meeting of sorts uh, that we, we got an update. Uh, apropos the maritime, uh, basically Susan reported uh, that uh, they're they're trying to engage some additional activities on city dock in terms of perhaps uh, allowing uh, periodic uh, charter fishing boats to come in and tie up and run their fishing charters out of city dock as well as out of uh, uh, out of the uh, the old faucet docks. Uh, also, we reported the on the conversation in the virtual meeting we had with BG and E concerning. Uh, moving forward with uh, some trial, uh, trying out uh, some of the kiosk concepts of putting a kiosk, perhaps one initially at the Harbor Master office. Um, uh, I'm, we're waiting to hear back from BG&E on that. And then the rest, of the, up, uh, the rest of the update really had to do with 
uh, current reopening uh, and timelines and uh, funding, et cetera, for uh, the Hillman Garage. The, the timeline is, uh, and Debbie, I think you were on the call, so correct me if I'm wrong, that the, uh, the, stud, the, the planning for Hillman Garage is in process. The actual construction of the Hillman Garage was not, would not uh, anticipate starting until right after the boat show of uh, 2021 uh, with the idea that with an 18 month completion time frame, uh, but looking to accelerate that completion time frame to perhaps as short as 12 months. Um, and, but with nothing really happening without, but nothing happening in terms of removing parking off the city dock until the, um, until the Hillman garage is on schedule to be completed and to, to pr basically provide the substitute parking uh, and then move forward in 2023, 24 timeframe with the actual city dock uh, um, uh, plan or uh, the uh, Susan Campbell Park uh, aspect of it. So I assume there's, I think the plan is for them to have different uh, updates every three months or so um, and I think that's basically being coordinated by Eileen Fogarty at this point. Right. Terry? Yes. The uh, issue of charter fishing boats operating out of city dock, they could do that now by using the charter dock. There's no prohibition and that's what it's for. Right, I understand. And I think part of it was uh, having them not just pick up, but also be able to uh, periodic on a, like a Friday night, be able to stay over a Friday night at the uh, um, at one of the other, you know, either at the state dock or, you know, elsewhere. So, okay. anyway, I, 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 she didn't get into any details and I haven't been privy to that. I just, that's what she was mentioning in the, in the conversation. Hey, Terry, Terry um, I do, I did talk to Susan about this idea. I think she's shifted it almost entirely to the, uh, the 110 Compromise Street dock. She's got a, a partnership potentially scheduled with Oasis Marinas, who's managing that dock. Um, and the program I think she's trying to do is just Fridays, basically a, a fish on Fridays kind of promotion. And I think it's more evenings where boats who are going to be able to offer fishing charters will, will run out of that dock and basically pull up there, wait for people to, to wander by and potentially go on a fishing charter or schedule a fishing charter to be able to leave from city dock. I think that's okay. where the problem is going right now. That's, that's the latest. All right. Th thank you, Mike. Um, Severn, uh, I haven't, uh, my, uh, while, you're, while you're talking, Mike, is there anything more on the Severn River restrictions? I know Frida had mentioned and sent us a picture of the buoy with the notice. I haven't heard anything more on it at this point. I don't know, Frida, if you or Mike know anything more on that. I haven't gotten anything back on, on my uh, application and I think it was submitted uh, incomplete. So um, the buoy that is out there, and there are, I think there are a couple of them along the Naval Academy symbol. I think those are the ones that are coming from the petition from, uh, from the Naval Academy itself. Right, I think it's the notice they had to post because they filed the application. So they have to post it on the water. Right, um, and, in, and in addition, they're gonna have to, to uh, to send DNR resources to the area to study the traffic. That's part of the, the regulation for, you know, adjusting a six mile an hour zone. So the Naval Academy has requested it and now DNR has got to put bodies there. So at the very least, maybe we'll get some enforcement on the, on the water this summer. So how do, you, how do you put one of those little uh, vehicle count things across the water for a boat? <laughs> I, I noticed that the Boat Act Advisory Committee doesn't meet until October 1st, so looks like it'll be a while before anything happens. Uh, city Dock reopening has been, uh, if, you've been, if any of you have been out on the water, as I have, uh, I have to confess that the waterways are remarkably crowded, um, both the creeks as well as the river, um, and they're uh, and maybe it's just to my untrained eye, there seem to be a few more um, irresponsible um, boaters and craft paddle crafters than usual, um, particularly coming in off the Severn uh, and they seem to not pay attention to that there is a six mile 
limit that starts out at the um, show marker, um, but um, perhaps as the novelty of going out on the water begins to wear off and people find they can go to a restaurant in town or something, maybe it'll settle back down. But it, it was noticeable the last two weekends um, on the water that it was A, yeah. crowded and B, not as courteous as it could have been. Yeah, you want crowded capital SUP has been putting a ton of people out through uh, Ellen Moyer Park, not to any detriment or anything. They're just doing a crazy amount of business. It's crazy. We, um, as one who brings his boat out of Javens, that <laughs> part of the crowd that is noticeable. All right, I'm going to put you everybody on mute for one second while I tell my wife. <laughs> Does anybody know if the uh, pump out boat's operational yet? The city pump out boat? They don't know that. It is Did not it? operational. I have an email in to David Gerald asking why not if we can have outdoor dining. I don't know why we can't have outdoor pump out, but. Um, okay, because um, the uh, West River, Road River, the new uh, Joint River Foundation. Uh, just sent me an email. Theirs is operational. It should be operational. I, uh, I I have to follow up. I sent Ed gave me a phone call saying he's deluged with pump out support Annapolis and nobody else is doing it and wanted to know why the and I just uh, a couple days ago cruised by and saw the harbor master boats over there. Uh, on up on their uh, lifts, uh, not doing anything, and um, I don't understand that. So I'll have to refollow up with David Gerald, the city manager. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, there being nothing else on the agenda, and the fact that um, my son is home for the first time since uh, December first, uh, I would like, and it's his birthday today. <laughs> I'll enter. I'll, I'll, that's why right. I was getting a phone call. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Hood, motion, second. Second the motion. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. 